Uh, Happy Hump Day, everybody. Welcome to Wednesday's edition of Murph's Boston Sports Talk. I am your host, James Murphy, a.k.a. Murph. You can find me at Murph's underscore Boston ST on both Instagram and Twitter. I hope everyone's having a wonderful hump day as it is Wednesday. We are halfway through the week and hopefully this podcast episode can help you push through the day, push through the week or push through whatever is going on that hopefully I can help you with. So I do just want to jump in. We're just going to dive right into it for our segment of quick Quick Red Sox made a trade with the New York Yankees. This is the second time it's happened this millennium. Um, previous one was in 2014. However, this one that just occurred the other day is a trade for pitcher Adam Ottavino. So the Red Sox are receiving pitcher Adam Ottavino and pitch, uh, pitcher Frank Herman from the New York Yankees in exchange for a player to be named later. Now, that sounds like an awesome deal on the Red Sox front, right? You get two pitchers for the price of one player that's currently a no-name. However... You got to consider this. Adam Ottavino is making a lot of money this coming year from the contract that he signed with the Yankees a couple off seasons ago. So can you call this a salary dump for the Yankees? Absolutely. And is that the reason why that they're throwing in another pitcher on top of it? Absolutely. Now the player to be named later situation is always a funky one because um, both teams come up with a list of, I believe, six or 12 players, and the two teams um, kind of have to agree on this list of six or 12 players. Then the team that's receiving the quote-unquote player to be named later has up to six months to choose who that quote-unquote player to be named later is. Usually it's a low-level prospect that may or may not turn into someone big, but that's just that on that front. Um I'm definitely looking forward to it. It definitely uh, shakes up the bullpen, which I have been ranting and raving about for the Red Sox to do something because their bullpen has astronomically sucked last year. You could even argue a little bit in 2019, and they absolutely did nothing up until this point, acquiring Ottavino from the Yankees. So this is a good sign that Bloom is pushing and making the moves to make the Red Sox bullpen better. He made the move to sign Garrett Richards um, to help the starting rotation out. So, you know, Heim Bloom is starting to throw into my face that they're not making any moves and that the Red Sox are just going to suck again this year. Well, I still stand by that point that they're going to suck. But he uh, he is making some moves in an attempt to be better. So I have to acknowledge the attempted moves and the attempted um acquisitions he's making in order to help this team go above and beyond and over the top obviously i mentioned before that these are good supplemental moves for something later on for a bigger splash adam Ottavino is definitely not that big splash but it's definitely not a small ripple he did have a down year last year having a above five era however hopefully he can bounce back to the pitcher that he once was with a devastating slider and uh we're just gonna have to wait and see on that one because I definitely think that this is a huge upgrade for the Red Sox bullpen, regardless of his um, 2021 salary. And I really think that if he can get back on track, that Ottavino can be a weapon in late games for the Red Sox and their bullpen. So I'm definitely excited about this trade, Uh, regardless if it's with the Yankees or not. Will that player be named later help them down the road? Potentially, but you can't fear helping an opponent when you desperately need help as well. Look at it. You get in two pitchers for the price of one player when you definitely need pitching help. So we're going to have to see who that player to be named later is down the road. We're going to have to see how this trade turns out a couple months into the season or so. It's just going to be one of those wait and sees. So I'm definitely excited that the Red Sox made a move and they brought in an arm, a name, like a big name arm. And I'm definitely Looking forward to see how it affects both the Red Sox and the Yankees being one of the most historied, uh, historical v- rivalries in not just baseball, but all of sports. And then my second quick hit take is I want to kind of go through my top five. Well, I guess in this case, it's going to be top six Patriots Super Bowl teams. Now... I know the Patriots aren't in the Super Bowl, 
and I know that they sucked this past year. But with Tom Brady making it to his 10th Super Bowl, in which he won six with the Patriots, six out of nine appearances with the Patriots, his 10th being now with the Bucks, I just want to take a second and reflect upon the past six Super Bowl victories for the New England Patriots that Brady's been a part of. I feel like this is a nice, uplifting little little segment right here because I have been talking a lot of crap about the Patriots based off of their 2020 season and what I hope that they do in the offseason. But I do have to take a moment and reflect on the Patriots' previous greatness, on Brady's previous greatness, and I can't ignore that. So I want to list off, in order, my top six Super Bowl teams of the New England Patriots to have win said Super Bowl. And I'm going to start off with number six being the 2018 New England Patriots. That was the year that they beat the Rams. They had a phenomenal defense. That was the year that they became a run team, a run first oriented team. And they stopped the Rams juggernaut on offense, um, their juggernaut offense. So that's definitely something to take note of. However, was it their best team? No. Was it a great team? Absolutely. Number five, the 2001 New England Patriots. And they just came out of nowhere. Um, Brady was came in to start early in the season after Bledsoe got injured. They just kind of rode the wave. They beat the Rams in that Super Bowl after losing to them earlier in the year, where the Patriots and like you know everyone around the team got a little juice, saying like, "If we see this team again, we can win." And little do we know, they eventually met again and they won thanks to a late minute field goal, a late second field goal, excuse me, by Adam Vinatieri. Number four, the 2014 New England Patriots. This was the Malcolm Butler interception at the goal line against the Seahawks. This is my, this is one of my favorite games, period, of all time was this Super Bowl. And not just because of the pick, but just because of everything that was happening. Patriots got up, the Seahawks got up. The Seahawks were up by 10 at the start of the fourth. The Patriots came back to score two touchdowns. It was just back and forth, a true battle of two top-tier teams. And ultimately, it could have gone either way. And it was just something throughout the course of the season, you could feel a little bit of magic how we haven't won a Super Bowl in would have been 10 years at that point. And you can just kind of feel it. The defense was playing good, especially the secondary. The offense was very electric all throughout. All guns were firing. So it was just something to really, to be fascinated and marveled at. And quite frankly, this team could be higher, but I think the teams that are above them are better for a few reasons. And I'm going to start with the 2003 Patriots being number three on my list. And the 2003 Patriots, when they beat the Carolina Panthers, that defense was still unreal. That Those first uh, three Super Bowls that they won in the early 2000s, was a had a huge huge defensive presence it really did as great as Brady was becoming and was at that time that that those three Super Bowls really really were impacted by the defense as they made timely plays they made great stops they held high scoring offenses in all three of the Super Bowls not just the one against the Panthers and also, Brady and the offense at that time was clicking on all cil- cylinders as well with Troy Brown, with Deion Branch, with Givens, Patton, and all them boys. Uh, so the 2003 Super Bowl is a good mesh of both offense and defense. Also, that game, that Super Bowl was electric to watch. It was one of those close back and forth games. Panthers had a chance there. Patriots got the chance. Then they took it. Um kind of like the Rams Super Bowl in 2001 but I don't know it just had a different feel to it because you weren't the underdogs you were supposed to win and you did win so I'm gonna give it I'm gonna give the 2003 Patriots my number three spot just because like I said both offense and defense were huge presences rather than in 2001 when the the defense was a huge presence and the offense was just up and coming with Brady being uh, a first year starter So I'm going to jump to my number two, my number two team. And we still have two Super Bowl uh, winning teams left in the 2004 and the 2016. But 
I think I'm going to give it to the 2016 Patriots being number two. And here's why. The Patriots didn't have Gronk. He got injured halfway through the season. He was out. So the offense was held back. Uh, The defense was young. They were trying to figure themselves out with the linebacking core, the front seven. The secondary was solid. It was okay. They definitely started to play a lot better in the playoffs. I feel like all the Patriots teams, they their offense and defense steps up, specifically the defense when it comes playoff time. And that was definitely the case in this season. And they were a phenomenal defense that year. The offense was great as well. I mean, there's numerous games that year that the Patriots blew out teams, that they won games that they may not should have won. They won games where they came back to win. It was just in a phenomenal season to watch as a fan. And then when you look at the Super Bowl being down 28 to 3, down 25 points with 17 minutes or so left in the game to come back and win, it's just an incredible feat from both the offense and the defense. And you can make a point saying that the defense gave up 28 points. However, afterwards, the defense was nails. The last quarter and a half after the Falcons scored their 28th point, the defense was nails. The Falcons couldn't do anything on offense. And yes, they had a couple big plays, a couple big runs. But when it mattered the most, sacks, stops, uh, high tower strip sack even. These are all big plays that the defense made that allowed the offense to be in the position to come back from 25 points and then come back from you know when they were down 16 and such. Being down 16 is two possessions, but you need two touchdowns and two PATs, which I think the PATs are probably harder to get. So for all those reasons, that's why the 2016 28-3 New England Patriots are my second best Super Bowl team to win out of the six. And that leaves the 2004 team to be number one. And the 2004 team is very similar to the 2003 team, except this year. Not only was the defense top tier with all them bad boys over there, but the offense, the offense has arrived. And now they had Corey Dillon in the backfield, still with Kevin Falk. I mean, those guys were beasts, let me tell you. I mean, the offense was a juggernaut themselves. The defense was impenetrable themselves. I mean, I mean to go back and to win the Super Bowl the year before, and then have the the grit and the grind to play a full scheduled season, then go on to the Super Bowl and to win it again, be two-time defending champions, to be three times in four years is insanely difficult to do. And the Kansas City Chiefs have a chance to become the first team to win the Super Bowl in back-to-back seasons since the 2003-2004 Patriots. Will that happen? That is yet to be foreseen. But that team was unbelievable to watch. I mean, the Eagles did what they could to make it a game. Ultimately, it was still a game. Timely defense kind of sealed it for the Patriots that year when McNabb threw the pick. But what can you say? And the reason, one of the reasons why the 2004 team is number one and maybe not 2003 is if you look at the 2001, three, and the four teams, the defense is the mainstay. I think the defense only got better over time, but the offense is what grew from 2001. It was a a first-year starter, second-year player in Brady with an offense that had some pieces but, you know, didn't have it together. Uh, 2003, they really got it all together. And then 2004, it was just, you know, next-level stuff by the offense and obviously next-level stuff from the defense, which we already knew about. So those are my top six In order, uh, best Patriots teams to win the Super Bowl. I'll recap. Number six being the 2018 team. Number five, 2001. Number four, 2014. Third place, 2003. Second place, 2016. And the number one team out of the Super Bowl winning Patriots teams is the 2004 Patriots. That's just my list, in my opinion, my reasons why I have that order the way I do. If you're watching on YouTube... Definitely comment down below your list, your order. Uh, Maybe you agree with me and why. Maybe you disagree with me and why. If you're listening on Spotify, Apple, Google Podcast, Amazon Music, wherever, 
reach out to me on Twitter and Instagram at Murphs underscore Boston ST and tell me what you think about the list, whether it was good, whether it was bad, you disagree with it, you agree with it. I'd definitely love to hear why. Whew. That was a lot. Okay. So now let's jump right into the topic box here. I got to get it. Okay, here we go. All right. So I kind of want to change the topic box into like a, a wheel of topics. So like I'll have like a, a automatic wheel online or whatever. And if you're watching on YouTube, you'll be able to see it. And I'll just click a button and it'll spin, 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 spin. And then the topic will come up. I think that's just another way to kind of generate a little bit of a randomness, a little RNG. But um, for now, we're going to rock with the topic box. And I want to get a good one here. I have to fill it up with more current topics. All right, let's see. Uh, Patrice Bergeron being named Bruins captain. Okay, so I did hit upon this before when I talked about Chara uh, leaving the Bruins and how Patrice Bergeron is obviously the the guy to replace him as the captain, and deservingly so. I mean, if it wasn't for Chara, I think Bergeron would have been the captain. Probably come... I don't know, probably soon after he got into the league, maybe right after Thornton left, to be honest. I mean, I can't really think of someone at that time who had an impact, who was so beloved by the fans, and who was so good at what he does, being a top-tier two-way player in the National Hockey League. I mean, this is definitely a long time coming for Bergeron, and is more than well-deserved. And quite frankly, this the C on his jersey still looks a little weird. I'm still used to seeing that A and having Chara as the captain, but seeing that crisp, crisp C on his jersey is so delicious. It's so rewarding and so deserved. I mean, like I said, I can't think of anybody else that deserves to be named the Boston Bruins captain other than Patrice Bergeron. I mean, the dude has put blood, sweat, and tears into every game, every, every play, every possession, every season, it, every hit. He's just so smart. He's so strategic with the puck. And him being on that top line with Pasternak and Marchand, all three of them meld together and work so good together. But I really think it centers around Patrice Bergeron. And like I said, I don't want to rant about it too much, but him being named Bruins captain is is so rewarding, is, is well-deserved, and probably overdue. But, I mean, you had Big Z in front of you on the team for uh, – 15, 14 years, so there's not much you can do there. But it's about time, and I'm so happy for him. That's really all I have to say. It's it's just that simple with Patrice Bergeron. I mean, who else was going to be the captain? Brad Marchand? Maybe. But you, no, you can't. And actually, the Bruins did a joke when they named uh, Bergeron the captain. I actually have it in the topic box. I'll just talk about it now. That um, ownership kind of played a joke and that they named Brad Marchand the team's captain. So they had Marchand come up, give a little speech. And he was like, yeah, this is nice and all, but, you know, all jokes aside, I think we all know who this belongs to. And then they finally announced that it was Bergeron. And the video of Bergeron's face, he had no idea it was a joke. He looked so upset. I'm not even kidding. I, I, when I was watching the video, I felt bad for the guy because he thought someone else was named captain over him. And... I don't think that's selfish at all. Like I said, well-deserved, overdue, and stuff like that. I mean, it, it was at the end of the day, he was laughing because it was a joke and it was funny and all. But, I mean, like I said, that's in here somewhere as a topic. But if I pull it, I'll just skip it because I just talked about it now. Um, let's get something good here. Yeah, What do we got? What do we got? Ooh, okay. So, the Patriots' top three positional needs. Well... We all kind of know they need a quarterback, right? That's self. That's basically common knowledge. Um, I want to exclude the quarterback need because I've talked about the quarterback need a good gazillion times on this podcast. I, I've talked about it more times than I can think and probably more times than I want to talk about it, to be honest. As we get close to the draft, I'd love to indulge in it a lot more. However, I'm not going to talk about it here. I'm going to go with the Patriots' top three positional needs outside of quarterback and number one i think has to be wide receiver i mean the wide receiver core for the majority of this year was 
Jacoby Myers, Nikhil Harry, and Demir Bird. Now, Jacoby Myers had a phenomenal year for who he was coming into the year, uh, considering what he did last year, which was almost nothing. So to have him have a surprise year, I think he was the team's leader in receptions and yards and all that good stuff. So I would have no problem with him being the number three wide receiver next year. And hopefully when he's back healthy, Julian Edelman can be the number two wide receiver. However, that leaves a huge gaping hole on the team. Now, we expected Nikhil Harry to kind of step in to be that number two guy and Edelman could be the number one. But I just think, you know, Edelman, if he comes back next year, is a year older, coming off a knee injury again. I just don't think he is the guy to be the number one receiver. I don't think Nikhil Harry has the type of skill set to be the number one receiver. Jacoby Myers, who knows? But, I mean, let's be honest here. Let's be realistic. So, their number one need next year is definitely wide receivers. To bring in one one guy, one veteran guy, and maybe draft another. Who knows? But, you know, what I would love to see the Patriots do is to go out and get Allen Robinson. I mean, the Patriots need a big threat receiver with size, experience, skill. Uh, put him on the outside. Put him in an offense that can utilize his skill set where you have Edelman going underneath. You can have Myers going in the middle. And then Allen Robinson can take the outside. Really spread the defense so one of the three can get open. I really think if you can get a quarterback and you can bring in Allen Robinson, considering you have hopefully Edelman and Jacoby Myers coming back, I think now you're kind of spewing a little bit. You know, you got a good wide receiver room right there, tons of experience with Edelman, a star caliber, a superstar caliber player in Allen Robinson. Then you got the young guys in Jacoby Myers, Nikhil Harry. Maybe they bring back Demir Bird. Maybe they bring in another another name or maybe they bring in another rookie who knows but I definitely think having a star-studded number one receiver my preference is just Allen Robinson but you can try to figure it out whichever way you could go out and trade for someone else or you like I said you can pay Allen Robinson which I think the Patriots should do and the Patriots have the cap to do that's just my number one need for the New England Patriots number two gotta be tight end Going back to the offense here, it has to be the tight end, and the tight end group sucked. Now, you can argue that the Patriots drafted two rookie tight ends in last year's draft in Dalton Keene and Devin Asiasi. Both of them did absolutely nothing this year. Ryan Izzo's a seventh-round pick, I believe, two drafts ago, was your main guy. He was your number one tight end, and that's no hit on him. I'm not trying to bash Ryan Izzo, but, I mean, in an offense that is used to having two stud tight ends or at least one stud tight end now has nothing there and they're getting absolute zero out of it which is putting more pressure and stress on the wide receivers to improve their play and also putting more pressure and stress on your run game to be better and to um, perform and when one goes that just puts more pressure and stress on the other therefore the defense can sell out on the other factor of your offense And now when they lock that down, you have no offense at all, which we saw for the majority of the season when you have no wide receiver or tight end play, when you have all your, all your eggs in one basket in the run game, all the defense has to do is fill up the box and stop the run because they know you can't pass on them because you have no threats out there. So I think addressing wide receiver being number one and definitely a tight end is definitely number two. I mean, what can they do? Can they go get Hunter Henry? Yes, the the Los Angeles Chargers tight end, I think that would be a great acquisition as he is projected to be a free agent. Could they um, tag him again? Probably. Should they? Who knows? Could you trade up in the draft and go get maybe a, a Kyle Pitts from Florida? Would love to see that, absolutely. But you got to also consider you just drafted two young wide, um, tight ends last draft and Ryan Izzo in the draft before. So it's, you kind of have, do you want to just go with a young tight end group and kind of go with the, with that group? Do you want to bring in experience? Do you want to bring in a star? Who knows? I think the tight end position needs to be addressed one way or another. And my preference would be Hunter Henry, but my preference would just be a star of some caliber at that position, at least a veteran. And I'm not talking about an aging Ben Watson like they had two years ago. But I'm talking about a tight end who 
has uh, a reputation of, you know, maybe going off a couple games, catching, you know, being a red zone threat. Because right now the Patriots have no red zone threats, whether it's a wide receiver or a tight end. So I think having that tight end threat in the end zone can really help spread that defense even further because now the defense has to match up with this 6'4", 6'5", tight end, you know, where you can just throw a goal line fade to and they can go up and catch it. So wide receiver number one, tight end number two, and number three, he's going to have to be linebacker. Yeah, I, I really think linebacker is the way to go here, whether it's I think inside linebacker is what you need to do because you have you have um, Anthony Jennings and you have Josh Uche that you just drafted last draft. Uche is very promising. He showed a lot. Jennings got a lot of uh, raw potential and talent there. You got Chase Winowich, Winowich, yeah, who plays on the line, who sometimes plays outside linebacker position, who was very good in his second year. And then you, in the inside position, you just kind of have Dante Hightower who sat out last year because of COVID. He's coming back. He's going to be a year older. So your full-time middle uh, inside linebacker was Jawan Bentley, and he was exposed a gazillion times. And as nice as a supplemental linebacker piece he is to that unit, he can't be a top inside linebacker or a top linebacker for your, your front seven period. And you got you have guys like Therese Hall, Michael Pinky coming, uh, potentially coming back. I mean, they're supposed to be free agents. Uh, Hall was a nice little piece this year. Uh, Pinky Pinkney, sorry, didn't really play as much. I just those aren't the guys I'm talking about. I'm talking about a stud middle linebacker. Now I don't want them to draft one with that 15th pick. I'd rather them focus it on offense. But going out and getting someone to go alongside Hightower, um, for if you want to go with a three four defense, I think is the way to go. Someone that can kind of, you know, eventually replace Hightower. Kind of like how Hightower replaced Mayo, Mayo replaced Brewski, and all that good stuff. I'd like to see them use that second round pick on on a middle linebacker, maybe. And I, I can't come up with names right now because I haven't seen. Uh, there's no projected uh, full seven round draft projections that I've come across yet that are viable. But this is definitely something that they need to uh, seriously look at is that middle linebacker unit. Like I said, high towers coming back a year older. What kind of player is he going to be? Might he even come back to begin with? He could just simply retire. Who knows? Jawan Bentley was a huge disappointment at the middle linebacker position being the play caller. I mean, they had to switch to Devin McCourty, your, your free safety to be the play caller. Cause Bentley just couldn't do it. So that's kind of my thinking about the middle linebacker core, the outside linebackers. I'm okay with, I like them. Now, could they switch Jennings, Uche, or Winowich to the inside? Maybe, but now you're giving up something on the outside, and now you've got to address that position yet again. So it's definitely something you have to be very careful and play with because you don't want to mess what you have good to make something bad become good. Now what was good is now bad. That's a lot of back and forth, but I think it makes sense. So those are my three top priorities for the Patriots to address in terms of their positional needs. Number one, being a wide receiver, a star studded wide receiver, whether you trade or if you sign via free agency, maybe move up in the draft and get a Jamar Chase or a Devontae Smith. I'll accept that as well. Number two, a tight end going after Hunter Henry, maybe trading for somebody. I would probably advise not drafting a tight end here unless it's Kyle Pitts. And then number three, addressing the inside linebacker group, um, trying to get someone to play alongside Dante Hightower, who can take that pressure off of him if he does decide to come back, which is not a certain as of now. So, ooh, I love these Patriot rants that I go on because usually right now, you know, we're talking about the Super Bowl with the Patriots, or we're talking about how they should have been in the Super Bowl, and just kind of having them being on the outside looking in is 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 completely different for me as a Patriots fan and probably all of New England and Patriots fans everywhere is is this is new territory for us so you know me kind of going on these obnoxious rants about how bad they suck and how they need this and how they need that is definitely going to be something you know to keep an eye on over the course of the rest of winter into early spring when we get into the draft and free agency but let's uh we have time for one more 
Uh, before I get into it, uh, what did you guys think of the uh, the special guest that I had on Monday, uh, breaking down the NFC, AFC, and the Super Bowl preview? I had my uh, two great friends, Andrew and Evan, on. It was a phenomenal interview where we were just going back and forth, talking about this, talking about that. Uh, so far, I've gotten great, great news about it. I've heard uh, great things of how interactive and how engaging everyone was and that having more guests on in the future is definitely going to be a possibility i'm definitely going to have them back on sooner than later but hopefully you know just having someone else to talk to where it's not just me just yapping and yabbing for you know 30 45 minutes whatever it is is definitely fun so i i thought it was awesome it was super cool to have you know some boys of mine on and definitely in the future i'm going to have more people on for sure and just kind of whatever is in the news at that time is definitely going to be uh, what we talk about because this is an unscripted, unscripted uh, bod- podcast where we just talk about what's going on in Boston sports and address any uh, major league-wide news. So enough of me digressing here. Let's just get into the last topic for the today, and it is... Oh, goodness. The Red Sox pitching rotation. So I did kind of address this previously, so I'm not going to harp on it too much. I did mention that they uh, previously, I mentioned that they did not address the position at all. Chris Sale, uh, I have no idea what his timetable is after Tommy John. Eduardo Rodriguez, his, his health comes first. He may not even play baseball again, so we can't count on him. Hopefully... You know, he's making some good progress to become healthier, just period, healthier. You have Nathan Ivaldi, who is kind of a shell of himself compared to the World Series uh, run. You signed Garrett Richards. It was a nice little acquisition there. And, you know, who you have coming up in the minors? Um, not a lot. Not a lot. I must say, though, I must say, I was very impressed with Tanner Huck um, and his Um, brief time with the uh, Red Sox this season in the shortened season I was very impressed with uh, just his presence and his and his stuff on the mound it was very very electric it was very good stuff he's a young promising pitcher which the Red Sox don't have a lot of and I'm definitely looking forward to seeing him in the rotation moving forward and hopefully for uh, years to come the same with Jay Groom I think these guys are are good young studs that have the potential to be the guys in the rotation uh once you know chris sale gets older and Ivaldi gets older and they kind of start to fade out but i mean a rotation with those two um groom and hook and then you can throw uh eduardo rodriguez back in the mix that's a solid rotation but right now with uh hook um uh, groom richards Ivaldi, that's solid that's okay but it's still you're missing that ace and that stud and Chris Sale or whoever it is. But f- for the Red Sox, it's Chris Sale. And that's something that's going to be definitely missed because, you know, to avoid a sweep, you bring out your ace. Uh, when you've lost three or four, you bring out your ace to kind of stop it. It's the start of a, a huge weekend series against the Yankees. You bring out your ace. And I think right now the Red Sox don't have an ace. Their ace is kind of injured, obviously, with Tommy John. But what kind of pitcher is he going to be post Tommy John? We don't know. I I'm going to stay on the trend that the Red Sox pitching staff period, not just the rotation, but their staff period needs significant help. Bringing in Garrett Richards, bringing in Adam Ottavino, which I mentioned on my segment of quick hits, are both big steps in improving the team. These are all supplemental pieces, though, to hopefully something bigger and better down the line. So I'm not going to go on too much of a rant about the Red Sox uh, pitching staff because I've done that also a, a gazillion times. But just know that there are a couple pieces on the Red Sox roster, young pieces that can have a huge impact as they make their um, step from year one to year two. Also, a couple of the acquisitions that the Red Sox have brought in via free agency have been nice. Hopefully there's another shoe to drop. Whether it's in the bullpen, in the rotation, we're just going to have to wait and see. But it's definitely going to be interesting to see where the Red Sox take the rest of their offseason as we come across spring training in just a few weeks. So it's definitely going to be interesting, like I said, to see what final moves that the Red Sox may make 
if there's any final moves to be made. And as I'm looking at the Red Sox uh, roster, Adam Adovino is already on there listed as number zero, uh, which was kind of expected. But, yeah. So, that was quick. Wow, they updated that super, super quickly. So, that's going to kind of wrap it up for this episode of Murph's Boston Sports Talk. Hopefully, it was enjoying. I covered a variety of topics. I covered all three sports except basketball. So, hopefully, we can... That was me shaking the topic box. Hopefully, we can talk about a little bit of basketball. uh, Tatum came back um, from COVID. I don't know if he was... um, I don't know if he was diagnosed with COVID, but I think he was a close contact or whatever. But he was back against the Bulls. He looked good like he never missed a step, which is a promising sign. But overall, it's a definitely an interesting time to be a Boston sports fan. Uh, so much chatter about free agency and the draft from the Patriots' perspective. How do you feel about Brady being in the Super Bowl and the Patriots aren't? That could have been you, but you, you just kind of sat on your hands and, you know, I don't know. You did nothing about it. So Red Sox make, trying to make some moves, trying to become a uh, contender of sorts in the American League East and in the American League in general. And then the Bruins, they got a nice overtime win against the uh, the Penguins last night, which is definitely promising because their 56-game schedule is going to go by quick, and it's also going to be against a lot of good teams. So we've got to buckle up for that. Overall, excellent episode covering a a variety of of topics going from left to right, up and down. It was a great time. But if you have anything that you'd like to add, reach out to me on Twitter and Instagram at Murph's underscore Boston ST. The ST stands for Sports Talk at Murph's underscore Boston ST. If you're watching this on YouTube, if you don't mind and if you enjoyed this, please comment, like, and subscribe. Um, it really helps it out, uh, helps the channel out, helps the podcast out, and just another way that I can reach out to the listeners, interact, and generate discussion because I love talking Boston sports, and I would love to talk it with you. Until then, enjoy the rest of your hump day, and I will catch you guys on Friday. Until then, though, be safe out there, all right? See ya!